Great. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Mangan. I'm one of the spine surgeons here, as Casey said, at Rothman. Uh, I'm, uh, it's my privilege today to talk to you about common conditions of the low back or the lumbar spine. Um, oops, let's see. So I, I thought I'd give everybody just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so I'm born and raised uh, in Delaware County, um, right around the Philadelphia area. I'm a graduate of the University of Scranton. Um, I went and I attended medical school at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, which is also located in Northeastern PA. Um, and then I came back down to Philadelphia and I did my residency uh, at Rothman at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Um, and then I went on to the Cleveland Clinic where I completed their combined neurosurgical and orthopedic spine fellowship. Uh, and now I'm, I'm uh, at Rothman. I serve as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery uh, at Thomas Jefferson. As Casey said, I see patients in Glen Mills as well as Bluebell and Lankanaw. Uh, and I operate at Riddle Memorial Hospital, Physicians Care Specialty Hospital, Chester County Hospital in Westchester. Uh, and Einstein Montgomery Medical Center in Montgomery. So today I'm going to try to make things fairly simple, and I'm going to talk about two of the common causes of pain uh, or two of the common reasons people come and see me as a spine surgeon. Um, we're going to talk about stenosis and radiculopathy. Uh, we're going to talk about how stenosis leads to something called neurogenic claudication and how leg pain or radiculopathy or commonly sciatica, how it uh, occurs and how we treat it. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end of the lecture. So to start, we'll talk about spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis is the abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal. So the spinal canal is the bony tube or channel where the spinal nerves and spinal cord live. Um, if you look at the picture on the screen, I've tried to outline the spinal canal in red. In the middle uh, of those red lines, you can see that there's a dark structure. Uh, at the top of the screen, that's the bottom of the spinal cord where that red arrow is pointing. And below that, the spinal cord ends and becomes the spinal nerve roots, which are the nerves that go to your legs and give us pain when they get pinched. Uh, that's at the bottom uh, on the, in the orange arrow there. So spinal stenosis is when you get some abnormal narrowing of the canal, which can occur from arthritis or wear and tear over the years. People can have herniated discs. They can have congenital stenosis, which means that their canal is just smaller than the normal or the average. Um, I'll put that in quotes because everybody's a little bit different. Um, and degenerative disc disease, meaning that just over time, as the discs can wear out, that people can begin to have more arthritis and bone, spur uh, bone uh, spurs form, which just make that canal more narrow. Um, I like to think of it kind of like an old pipe. And as a pipe can get built up on the inside over time uh, and make flow through the pipe harder, it's the same idea in the spinal canal. As things build up within the canal, uh, it makes the signals for those nerves harder to go to our legs uh, and painful, uh, and that's why patients end up getting symptoms. Next, we'll briefly talk about radiculopathy. Radiculopathy is what everybody refers to as a sciatica, and that's that pain down your leg, that nerve pain, electrical pain. Um, and there's different types of sciatica because it depends on what nerve is really getting pinched. The picture on the right here is what we call the dermatomes, and that's a, a schematic of where each nerve provides sensation. So when we're in the office, we're asking people, you know, where do you feel the pain? Is it on the side of your leg? Is it in the back of your leg? And, you know, while we're having that conversation, I'm in my head trying to figure out, you know, what nerve they're describing uh, is getting irritated. Uh, and we want to make sure that that matches up with patient's imaging later on. Um, when patients have radiculopathy, this can be caused from many different things, such as a herniated disc. Um, they can also have back pain along with their leg pain, uh, and they can be associated. And patients can get uh, radiculopathy from the same causes that they can get spinal stenosis. Disc herniations, degenerative disc disease, and overall arthritis um, can lead to a pinched nerve that goes down your back, uh, back of your leg or the front of your leg. So now let's get into how these apply in the lumbar spine. So once again, just to define, you know, what we're talking about, lumbar stenosis is the abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal. And in this picture here, you can see, again, the spinal canal is uh, surrounded by this white fluid here at the top. That's the spinal fluid with the, with the spinal cord and the spinal nerves in it. As we get down closer to this red hour, you can see that you can't really see any more of that white fluid. And that's because there's some abnormal pinching of the nerves there which is kind of pinched off that water balloon that the nerves live in uh, where the spinal fluid is. Uh, and we can't see uh, any of that fluid left, meaning that it's everything is compressed. So how do patients present to the office? Um, so patients will often come in um, with a, a chief complaint saying that they have difficulty walking. 
Um, often they'll say that I used to be able to walk for exercise. I could walk a mile a year ago, and now I can only walk a quarter of a mile before I have to lean forward or sit down. People will say that they notice that they bend further forward as they walk. Uh, and patients will have either pain in their back, pain in their legs, or sometimes not really much pain at all, but just walking intolerance. And people will often find that it's worse when they try to stand up straight. And some of my patients will even say that laying flat in bed makes their symptoms worse or their back pain or leg pain worse. You know, a couple additional symptoms. So pain, like we talked about, it can be in the back, it can be in the legs. Patients may develop numbness and tingling as the nerves continue to get pinched. Um, and they can get weakness or cramping in some of the muscles of their legs. And they can develop a syndrome, which we call neurogenic claudication. Neurogenic claudication is really just a group of symptoms that kind of um, are typical of patients that have spinal stenosis. And these include pain in the buttock, um, some pain down the legs. Typically, it's in the back of the legs, but it can be on the sides or in the front. People will feel that they have a heavy heaviness in their legs. They'll often say that they feel like they're dragging their legs after they walk 100 yards, 100 feet. It really varies depending on how severe their stenosis is. Uh, and difficulty walking distances because of that heaviness in their legs. An interesting thing that I, I often ask patients is, you know, for those patients that feel that they can't walk a long distance uh, when they're standing up straight, if they go to the grocery store and they're able to lean on a cart, do they find that their symptoms are better and they can walk further? We call this the shopping cart sign. This is actually like one of the, the few things they teach, you know, most physicians in medical school, um, because the, what happens is as patients lean forward, and you're holding onto the cart, you actually stretch out some of the ligament in the back of the spine that's pushing on the nerves and it actually makes more room for them temporarily. And that's why patients start to hunch further forward when they, when they walk and why the shopping cart helps relieve their symptoms. So how does stenosis occur? Well, it's a degenerative process. It's like knee arthritis or, or hip arthritis, shoulder arthritis. It, it happens because of wear and tear over time. And what happens is uh, patients will have either uh, the bones or the joints in the back of the spine, which you can see in the bottom picture here, there is um, a model of the spine, and you can see that there's a red area between the bones in the back of the spine. These are called the facet joints, where you can see that red kind of irritated looking, um, what's supposed to be bone in this picture. And what that is, is it's showing there's arthritis in those joints there. And just like knee arthritis or shoulder arthritis, patients can get bone spurs there, um, which unfortunately in the spine, when they form bone spurs, um, most of the time, they'll form them into the spinal canal. So that takes up room into this tight area where the nerves live. Uh, the discs can wear out, like you can see uh, at the top pictures here, the picture on the left, that's a, a young, healthy spine or a normal, healthy spine. And on the right, this is a spine that, um, you know, has begun to have some, some degenerative changes and the discs are worn out. Um, and the disc space or the height between the bones is much smaller. And you can see how we can't see that nice white fluid that we see on the left picture. Everything looks like it's, it's tight and getting pinched. And that's just part of that degenerative process where patients are developing uh, bone spurs. And additionally, uh, sometimes patients will have, um, you know, a relatively normal looking spine, but may have a very large disc herniation. Uh, and we'll talk more about what that is later. Uh, but that actually, that disc herniation takes up the majority of the room within the canal. Uh, and patients will present with, with uh, bad spinal stenosis. Another reason that patients can get spinal stenosis is from abnormal alignment or motion of the bones of their lumbar spine. So in the picture here, I've outlined in red the back of the vertebral bodies. That's the bone in the front of the spine. I often tell patients that's the bone that kind of builds this up and the discs live between it. And what happens is in some people, the, the vertebral bodies will start to move out of place and not move as one unit. And what can happen is the vertebral body typically uh, the more superior vertebral body, the one closer to the head, will shift forward um, on the vertebral body below. As you can see in this picture, the top line is kind of more towards the left uh, than the bottom line. And what that does is it makes the, the canal, makes that the tube, um, instead of one straight tube, there's a little kink in it. And patients will develop more arthritis in this area. And you can see here that they've developed st uh, spinal stenosis in this area because we can't see that white fluid traveling through it. Um, and this is actually fairly common. Um, I, this sounds, um, when I talk to patients about this, I know this sounds like something very dramatic, but it, it's about 6% um, of the total population of adults have this uh, problem. Uh, it's more common in women, um, but, but we certainly see it a lot. And there's, there's various ways to treat it, which we'll talk about in a little while. 
Next, we'll move on to radiculopathy. Uh, so this is, again, what people commonly refer to as a sciatica. This is a pinched nerve in the back um, where pain goes down the leg. And the reason you feel the pain down the leg is each of those nerves innervates a certain area of skin uh, and muscles that go down your leg. And when that nerve gets pinched, all, that whole area can get irritated. So uh, in the office, we're trying to figure out what area is irritated so we can try to match it up um, uh, with the uh, specific nerves that are irritated. And you can see on the picture here, these are the common uh, lumbar spinal nerves that patients will feel pain with. Uh, pinched nerves can occur for the same reasons that people get spinal stenosis. They can have herniated discs, they can develop degenerative disc disease or arthritis, and even lumbar stenosis from those variety of causes. Some patients will present with a combination of radiculopathy and lumbar stenosis, um, and we'll tease that out in the office. Again, uh, the symptoms of this are pain down the leg in that area where the nerve innervates. Um, patients can get numbness and tingling and even weakness or muscle weakness. Um, often patients will come to my office and they've lost the ability to lift their foot up or move some of their toes because the nerve is so irritated, it's kind of let those muscles get weak um, and requires further evaluation. I've said herniated disc a couple of times, and I know that's something that patients always have questions about. So when we talk about a herniated disc, a herniated disc is when part of the intervertebral disc, so the outside of the disc is like a jelly donut, and it's kind of more firm. And on the inside of the disc, there's a jelly-like substance, which helps absorb the shock of our daily lives. Um, and sometimes what will happen is you'll get a little hole or a little rent in that outside of the donut or the outside of the vertebral disc, and some of that jelly will push out into the spinal canal. Now, it causes a problem in really two ways, one of which is it causes uh, compression. So meaning that it pinches that nerve and it pushes it up against the bone like you can see in this picture. The other way that it causes a problem is that this substance is very irritative to, uh, to our bodies when it's outside of the vertebral disc. So when it happens, we get a big inflammatory response. Um, and this often causes a lot of the acute pain that patients feel when they have a herniated disc. And we'll talk about how we treat that uh, in just a moment. The important thing about stenosis and radiculopathy is to understand that there's multiple causes that can lead to patients having symptoms. And often, although we talk about them in isolation, they often occur together uh, and they occur um, simultaneously. And when we treat them uh, as kind of one unit, um, but this is definitely a source of a lot of um, problems and symptoms for patients and something we deal with on an everyday basis in our office. So what happens when you come to our office for a visit? So it all starts with a history and physical exam. Um, and what I mean by that is I want to know when the pain started, where do you feel it? Um, what have you done to try to treat it so far? Um, and then the physical exam is very important, particularly I like to get every patient up and get them to walk. I want to see how they can move within the room. Um, how their gait is, um, are they having a painful gait or are they weak? Um, and then I'll test all of the major muscle groups in the arms and legs. And then I think really the most important part of, of the physical exam for me is looking for other causes of pain besides something that's coming from the spine. Um, in the lumbar spine, in the low back, we often see a lot of overlap with patients with knee and hip issues. Um, and I, I really try to make sure that we're not missing a hip arthritis or hip bursitis um, meaning that, you know, arthritis in your hips that's causing pain in your thighs or in your back, uh, pain on the sides of the legs can be sometimes from an irritated um, uh, bursa over the hip. Uh, so we try to tease that out and make sure that we're treating the right thing in the office. We'll get x-rays um, of the lumbar spine in the office. Uh, on the left here, you can see this is a, a view where we're looking directly at the patient, and this lets us know if their spine is nice and aligned. Um, and there's no scoliosis. In the picture on the right, we're looking at the side view or the lateral view. Um, and this lets us see the alignment of the bones. Here, I'm looking for that spondylolisthesis or that abnormal motion or alignment that we talked about before. And I'm looking at the space in between the bones. If you see here um, on the picture on the right, on the lateral view, there's uh, the vertebral body is labeled L4, and the one below it is labeled L5. And I judge the health of the disc by looking at the space in between those two bones. And I can't see if there's a herniated disc or anything like that on the x-ray, but I can get a general sense of how healthy that segment of your spine is just by looking at the lateral x-ray uh, and the overall alignment. Patients will often ask, you know, can we get an MRI or should we get an MRI right away? And I often say that, you know, for patients with acute symptoms, that we try to hold off on getting an MRI right away 
And the main reason is that the MRI might show us more information than we necessarily need or want. Um, this was a study by Dr. Bowden, um, who looked at patients that had no history of any back or leg pain or signs of neurogenic claudication. And he found that 57% of patients that had no symptoms had abnormal MRI, had an abnormal MRI that were over the age of 60. 36% of those patients had a herniated disc and 21% had spinal stenosis. Even in patients younger than 60, they found that a third of those patients had an abnormal MRI, even without symptoms. And 20% had a herniated disc. One patient actually had spinal stenosis. And in the youngest cohort between 20 and 39, 35% of them had some kind of abnormality found on their MRI. And the reason I say that we wait is because the majority of patients will get better with conservative management. And, you know, sometimes the MRI will, will lead us to, uh, down a, a path that we don't necessarily need to, to go down for every patient yet. Um, and maybe showing us, you know, pathology that's not necessarily symptomatic um, that we don't want to um, aggravate. But in patients that we do get an MRI for, uh, these are patients that have persistent symptoms, meaning that they fail conservative management of time or um, some of the non-operative treatments that we'll talk about in a moment. We get an MRI in patients that have weakness. Uh, so if we're worried that a muscle group is weak in the lower extremity, that's a reason that we get an MRI quicker. And then we have red flag symptoms. So patients can develop something called cauda equina syndrome. Um, and what that means is when they have a lot of spinal stenosis or uh, pinching of the nerves in their low back, they can develop bowel and bladder incontinence or saddle anesthesia, meaning they can't feel their groin uh, an area. And that's, a, that's usually uh, an emergent type of uh, clinical picture. So those are patients that we usually send to the hospital and get an MRI right away for. So let's talk about treatments. So here at Rothman, we really have a, a team-based approach for how we approach our, our spine patients. We have a great team of non-operative spine physicians, physical therapists, and surgeons that really try to work with our patients uh, and give them complete care uh, through all of the different modalities to treat them. The first-line treatment uh, for somebody with an acute radiculopathy or sciatica um, or some who has their first episode of a flare-up of stenosis, we try to treat this conservatively with anti-inflammatory medications. And this can be medications such as Advil or Aleve. There's prescription versions of those, such as like Mobic or Meloxicam, which can help patients. Um, and we also give patients steroids sometimes to try to help calm down that inflammation, particularly when patients have that herniated disc that causes a lot of acute inflammation in that area. And these medications can be very helpful in trying to take down that inflammation and improve their symptoms. Often we'll prescribe physical therapy to try to work on strengthening and stabilizing that inflamed area and strengthening the core uh, to try to help alleviate uh, patient's symptoms. And the, the good thing for patients is that 90% or more of patients that have spinal stenosis or radiculopathy will get better without surgery. These treatments will work and they'll go back to their lives um, before the pain started for the most part. For patients where that first line treatment doesn't work or hasn't worked fully and patients still are symptomatic, then we can debate getting an epidural steroid injection. These are both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, I often tell patients that these are very helpful in two ways. They can help alleviate your symptoms. And then for me, as a surgeon, it helps me to identify that we're treating the right pain generator. You know, if we can give an injection that gives some relief, even if it's temporary, then we know that we're treating the right area and we're targeting the right um, uh, area to treat your pain. So lastly, for patients that have kind of failed uh, conservative management and time and their symptoms are progressing to the point where they feel like they, they need something else or other form of treatment, then we usually talk surgical intervention. And the goal of surgery is really to make room for the nerves. There's a variety of ways that we can do that. Um, and I've listed kind of three of the more common procedures that we do to try to treat patients with lumbar stenosis. The first is a laminectomy. And a laminectomy involves removing some of the bone in the back of the spine and the ligament to expose the, uh, to expose the nerves and make sure they're all nice and open. Uh, this doesn't require a rods or screws or anything like that. This is just purely to open up that area to take the pressure off the nerves to try to help alleviate patient's symptoms. In some cases, patients have that abnormal motion or they have an alignment issue uh, that requires us to try to fuse that area because if we took the pressure off of the nerves through a laminectomy alone, then sometimes what will happen is that abnormal motion will get even worse and patient's symptoms will come back. So in that case, we perform what's called a lumbar fusion, and we put rods and screws in there just to keep those two bones in place. 
Uh, and then we put um, <clears throat> a uh, we put some bone in that area to try to make those two bones one bone. So it doesn't have that abnormal motion anymore and they move as one unit. And lastly, um, for patients that have uh, a herniated disc uh, that is acute um, and has failed conservative management, we've tried injections, therapy, time. Uh, sometimes we'll perform what's called a microdiscectomy, which is when we make a small opening in the back of the spine and we take out that area of the jelly that's herniated out. We leave as much of the healthy disc there uh, as we can. We just try to take off the top aspect uh, that's kind of herniated out, that's in the bad place, pushing on the nerve to try to alleviate those symptoms. And so that's the, the, the common uh, issues that we deal with a lot in the lumbar spine. Uh, thank you very much for all uh, joining in and for your time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mangan. That was fantastic. Um, let's see, we do have a question um, and I'm just going to uh, guide the audience a little bit. If it gets too detailed, we may have to stay away from it, but um, we welcome any of the general questions. Uh, could a herniated disc in LS mimic a severe trochearic bursitis? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know. Um, it, the, I guess the short answer to that is yes. I mean, I, I think some patients get lateral hip pain um, that, you know, potentially could be neurologic in, in nature. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, uh, for patients that are seeing me, that we try to work through it in a systematic way and trying to rule out one versus the other uh, through various kind of treatment modalities to make sure we're, we're um, treating the right thing. But, but that's a common um, question that people ask and that people have is that overlap between trochanteric bursitis and uh, like a sciatic or, or um, a radiculopathy down the leg. Great. Uh, next question. How do I know if the pain in my left leg and back is caused by my hip been diagnosed with osteoarthritis in left hip or my back? Well, that's a great question. Um, and this is, it's a, it's a hard answer. Um, so for patients that see me, I will typically send them for a hip injection um, to see if it will alleviate uh, their pain. Um, and if, if the injection takes away their back pain uh, and helps their mobility, then I typically will refer them to my hip colleagues for evaluation. Um, in general, we try to refer to you know, if it's a hip issue uh, versus a spine issue, um, and we think it's the hip, then I, I usually will have all of my patients evaluated by a hip doctor first. Uh, and the injection is very helpful in helping me delineate whether it's really the hip or the back. Good question. Um, next one, are there permanent lifting restrictions after a lumbar fusion? Uh, no, not typically. Um, so typically, um, once, you know, the, the, the fusion is fully healed, we let patients go back to, um, uh, you know, all of their activities that they want to do for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions to that, but, but typically no, there's no, um, weightlifting restriction permanently. Okay. Is a herniation more likely to reoccur following a micro Um, so, you know, one of the things that we worry about when we take out the herniated disc is that patients will have what we call a recurrent herniated disc. I wouldn't say it's more likely, um, but I typically tell patients that, you know, you've herniated this disc once, so you already have a weakness in that area. So uh, there's a chance it could herniate again. I really try to keep patients um, lifting, twisting, and bending restrictions for about 10 weeks after surgery to try to minimize the risk of that happening. Uh, certainly, it's, it's a concern of all spine surgeons that that happens. Um, and we haven't really found a good solution to try to prevent that yet. Very active 79 year old, no underlining health issues. Is age a detriment to surgery? No, not typically. Um, you know, we, I think as a, as a surgeons in general have been operating on older and older patients as our um, techniques and anesthesia have gotten better. And as the population ages, I mean, we operate um, now regularly on patients, you know, in their mid eighties quite frequently um, that have bad spinal problems or hip problems. Um, and that's typically not something that we, we truly worry about for the most part, especially if they're healthy, obviously. Great. For several spinal stenosis, how much of the vertebrae is removed? Oh, I'm sorry, severe. So for severe spinal stenosis, uh, it really depends. It depends where the spinal stenosis is. Um, but typically we remove 
kind of the middle. Um, we remove the spinous process, which is the bump. If you feel your back, you can feel those, those bones in the back. That bone is removed. And then the lamina is removed. And we try to leave, um, not to get too specific, but we leave uh, approximately a centimeter of the pars, which is the bone on the side of the lamina. Um, we leave about a centimeter on each side to try to prevent instability from occurring. Uh, so we take everything kind of in the middle of that, but we try to leave enough bone uh, so that, you know, patients don't have an issue afterwards. Has TLIF become more common? Um, yes. I, I mean, I think uh, a, a TLIF is, is a common procedure that, that many of us perform. Um, and what that does is it allows us to kind of restore the height of the disc when uh, the disc is worn out and the bones start to collapse. Um, what happens is uh, sometimes the bones itself will, will get closer together and the nerves in your spine actually leave underneath the bones on the sides. So when the bones get closer together, they can, patients can get what we call bony stenosis um, or, or um, up, down, or cranial caudal stenosis. So a T-lift helps us to restore the height in between those bones. And I tell people it's like putting a car jack in and we actually try to lift the height of the tunnel where the nerve leaves just to open it up and make more room. Um, okay. Uh, if someone has an extrusion in T7 and T8 and also L3 and A4, L4, with thigh muscle weakness, how do you determine which to treat in surgery? PT and spinal injections have been used over the past years. Can one surgery treat both conditions or would it be two separate surgeries? Um, you know, that's, it's, um, that's a, a, a little bit of a complex question to answer. Um, and the reason I say that is that muscle weakness in the thigh, typically I would think of as more of like an L3 and an L4 issue. Um, there are other symptoms that you can get from a herniation in the thoracic spine um, that would kind of need to be answered. Um, we worry that sometimes when patients have disc herniations in the thoracic spine, that they can develop bruising of the spinal cord, which can give you a gait imbalance um, and some abnormal reflexes uh, in the lower extremities. Um, so it, it would really depend on that patient's um, imaging and exam to figure out what the, what the optimal treatment would be. Um, someone asked me to repeat the phone number I gave. I'm sure that is 610-480-6584. I did type it in the chat box, but I'm going to repeat it. 610-480-6584 if you need to schedule an appointment with Dr. Mangan. Um, again, 610-480-6584. Um, Someone did have a question or wrote something about uh, a former family athlete with L5 S1 disc herniation, but there's no, it's not really a, a question. So I'm not sure. Do you see that, Dr. Mangan, or no? I do. I'm trying to. Um... So, you know, it, it, a previous herniated disc, if it wasn't treated, can still cause symptom, uh, symptoms from time to time. Um, and, and patients can certainly feel, uh, differences when they do that. Um, you know, sometimes it'll, it'll, you know, calm down. Sometimes it'll become more aggravated and those will, um, you know, continue to bother people over time. And sometimes they'll settle down and they won't have issues from them again. Patients who sometimes feel popping or, or, um, clicking in the back of the spine, that can be arthritis. It can be, uh, really a variety of things. It can be sometimes that instability that we were talking about. Um, and other issues there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that um, I think could be teased out and looked at um, on a patient by patient uh, experience. Um, for general low back pain, what exercises or activities do you recommend to help alleviate or prevent it getting worse? Uh, that's a great question. So I, um, you know, low back pain, I think is something that a lot of patients struggle with. A lot of us in general struggle with um, I think being active is very important in patients who have low back pain. I think walking is probably the most important exercise you can do. I am a big fan of telling patients that if they have access to uh, a pool or a body of water, um, that I think aqua therapy or just walking in a pool uh, is really helpful in treating low back pain. I've had a lot of success sending patients for aqua therapy to try to help alleviate some of their symptoms. Um, because often it's, it's a combination of things that leads to back pain. It's, it's muscles, it's arthritis, um, and it's hard to pinpoint that, you know, very rarely is back pain um, a, a surgical problem um, because 
it's hard to necessarily have the right answer for patients in that regard. Um, but I think there's a lot of good exercises and things like that. Um, if you uh, go on the internet and if you type in um, AAOS spine conditioning, uh, there is a handout through the Orthopedic Academy, uh, which I think I think is very good. And that's that's one of the handouts I give out to patients uh, that works on stretching your neck and your low back uh, and working your core muscles in a way that's uh, aimed at trying to help alleviate pain. I'm just looking to see if I can send that real quick. Um, oh, perfect. That'd be great. All right. There's usually a PDF if you click on it. Yeah, I think I did it. So um, you, I just uh, shared that in the chat box. Um, that should be at the bottom of your screen if anyone needs that. And I can also send it out. Um, I did record this presentation, so I will be sending this out probably in the next four to five days. It takes a little bit to upload to YouTube and get everything um, edited. So uh, look that for that in your email. It'll come from me, Casey McLaughlin at Rothman, um, and I will include that link uh, to the exercises. So thank you, Dr. Mangan, for coming Great. on, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you have any questions um, or, you know, I, I shared that phone number, you will have my email once I send out this link. So feel free to uh, reach out if you need anything. So I appreciate it. And everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.